Wake up, son. Oh, you are awake. We woke you last week, remember? Hello, you guys. First, I want to thank you for sending in some wonderful stories and great pictures that you're going to get to see throughout this show. I want to see if you remember what we talked about last week. We had three very interesting characters explaining the winter solstice, that shortest day and longest night of the year. There was that utterly brilliant, erudite scientist. I'm sure you remember her. She's soon to win a, a great prize, I'm sure. And she explained how the Earth is tilted on its axis as it rotates around the sun. And when, in our hemisphere, we're tilted furthest away from the sun, that represents our shortest day and longest night of the year, the winter solstice. Well, that's what she told us. There was a very funny guy from the British Isles. He didn't believe it at all. Neither did the Saturnalia Reveler from Rome. They both said, what? They knew there were other reasons that the days got short and the nights got long. And if we didn't sing certain songs and do certain dances and light certain lights, the sun might never come back. This week, we're going to explore the ways other people around this earth celebrated that time. What was the solstice to them? We're going to begin at Waltham High School. And you're going to see a reenactment of an authentic solstice celebration from ancient Rome. A Saturnalia celebration. Come, celebrate with us. Cornelia and Quintus are the hosts of the party. They'll welcome Rufus, the warrior, home from the battlefield, and Marshall, the poet, and Julius, the public worker. The cook and the maid are looking forward to a few surprises tonight. Honey, who's coming to our Saturnalia party tonight? Julius the Idol's coming, so is Rufus the Knight and Marshall the Poet. How are Bobby. you today, Rufus? I'm fine. Got some carrots from Africa. Oh, wonderful. I'll go give those to the cook right now. Was that where your last campaign was? Yes. Mm. Conquer some tribes. Yo, Saturnalia. Sally, Marshall. How are you? How's it going? I'm fine. Oh. I brought you a scroll of poems, my very best poems, for Saturnalia. Thank wow. you. Sally, Sally. Oh, how are don't you today? touch me. Do something with this. What do I want with this? <laughs> Just Sally, get over here. So are you two together? No, no. we're not together. Oh. Well, anyways, I brought you apples from far away. Oh, wonderful. Oh, These look very food. nice. They are. So where's the food? Oh, the cook should be coming out with the appetizer. Good, yeah. Now. So mom no. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no. Oh, no. You fool! I'm, oh, I'm what sorry. are you doing? Oh. Beat him! Really Gisella, help! Don't beat him! It's not a nine! You can't beat him! I, I didn't mean for this to happen, Master. Sure. Yum. Yeah. It is already loud. This is our finest wine. What is this again? Apple Thermos. Mm, it is we good. The queen of the night is Drusilla. Yeah! Saturnalia, a week when the military man, <laughs> the merchant, and the supervisor of public works <coughs> enjoy their leisure clothes. <coughs> it's freezing, but Julius will dice while water freezes in the pipes. We will exchange the roles of rich and poor and give gifts according to our own ability. Marshall, you must sing I'm a Little Teapot. Oh. 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 Come on, go. Let's go. Ah. OK. <laughs> I'm a little <laughs> teapot, short and Mine. stout. Come on. Here is my handle, here is my spout. Oh, when man. I get all steamed up, hear me shout. Tip oh, me over and pour me out. Yeah. Nice dance. Julius, you must wash Daus's feet. 
You must do the chicken dance. Rufus, you must do the hokey pokey. Uh, <laughs> the hokey pokey. Uh, okay, do the hokey pokey now. You put your right hand in. Oh, wait. Uh, uh, you put your right hand in. Come on. Come on. Come on. You put your right hand in. Shake it. Come on. Shake it. Come on. Shake it. Do the hokey pokey. Oh, Turn yourself around. That's why it's what all hokey pokey. <laughs> Cum steteri nullus vultu tibi talus eorum munera me dices magna de dice tibi. Dice! Oh, and they have the same side. No, they Is have the same thing on the same side. Sequid ad hoc superest in nostri facke locale. Wow, empty, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. Why you spent too much money? A book. You gambled for me. Perle game onio cantatas harmonie. Rana said frontum, nugi sore disque mais. A little book. Wow. wow. Copy some of those poems, then you'll have some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those are very good poems. And this is for you, Drusilla. Ooh. Si parsum totas nisisi lacrinas, nunc tatum capiti munar mito tuo. A cap, symbolizing my freedom. Well, will I get my freedom? <laughs> when you marry the cook down. <laughs> Yo, Saturnalia. That's really what people said. Yo, Saturnalia. And then they greeted each other. That would be fun. I mean, a lot of the parties that we have in our homes around this time of year have a lot of the same variables. I mean, you saw them greeting their guests. And then they did wild things. They exchanged roles. So the servant got to call the shots. And then they gave each other outrageous gifts. I mean, how often do you bring people carrots as a house gift? And then they gave... They gave their guests silly gifts, boxes with nothing in it. And they paid a poet to come and make poems about everyone. They had a wonderful time. They ate, they drank, they made merry, they did the chicken step. I don't know how to do that. How did they know how to do that in ancient Rome? Well, Rome is in Italy. And it's a little warmer than the places of the north. So they dealt with the solstice a little differently. It wasn't quite as scary. As you can see, it was a lot more fun. Way up north in places where the sun sometimes doesn't even shine. The solstice was a very, very serious time. A very dear friend of mine, Nimu Sloan, a cultural consultant from Finland, is here with some of her friends to teach us about the primarily Swedish holiday, St. Lucia's Day. <laughs> the sights and sounds that wake up parents all over Sweden in parts of Norway and Finland on Lucia Day on the 13th of December. Lucia um, is the oldest daughter in the family and her younger sisters would be her attendants. Some older sisters might just be dressed festively and an older brother or younger brothers can be star boys and of course the very youngest might be Tomten. 
In the fourth century, uh, Lucia was a noblewoman in Italy who had become a Christian and had learned about caring and sharing. Uh, Lucia was um, uh, find other people who believed like she did, but she was misunderstood by many who did not want to care and share. And so Lucia had um, heard that up north there was a country that was totally in darkness. The sun had forgotten the land. It was cold and the country was covered and blanketed with snow. People were hungry in their homes. Lucia was coming up north with her cohorts to serve them food and comfort. And so Lucia came up north and the people were looking out of their windows in their dark, cold houses. And they saw this light coming towards them. As they got closer and closer, they realized it was a woman and her friends who came in bearing gifts of food and comfort to them. And so now, Swedes all over remember this Lucia day and remember her goodness, and they remember her by reacting the whole uh, story. And in schools, there are parties when um, kids would be, the whole school is dressed, and they sing a whole concert to parents. There are also people in workplaces who would have Lucia Fest, like we have special holiday parties. And we'll sing you one little song that would be sung in the evening in, in greeting. Okay. God er afton, god er afton, vore herre og fru. Vi ønsker er alle en fredde for you. Good evening, good evening, both ladies and gents. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, <laughs> it's not the same. How many candles you got there? I got five. Oh, I have eight. Oh, and one went out. Last night we lit eight in honor of the Festival of Lights. That's what Jews celebrate this time of year. A Hanukkah. What do you call yours? Um, this is Santa Lucia Day. Santa Lucia, Hanukkah. You know, I, I think we got a connection here. And obviously, even though we're celebrating the right to pray, it's also celebrated with... Would you guys blow these out for me? If it was still Hanukkah, we wouldn't be allowed to do that. You gotta let them burn all the way down. Do you have to let yours burn all the way down? No. <laughs> Wait, so I have a question. I mean, so many things you think are the same. Before Santa Lucia's day, how would you guys have celebrated this time of year? Well, I know a lot of people, they lit fires to bring light to their homes. They also would have a lot of feasting and food and merrymaking. Party, party, party. Yeah, I saw that Yule log. What's a Yule log? A Yule log is the largest log they could find in the forest for the fire that would burn on and on to keep the night away. So people would sit all night by the fire and then they'd party, party, party. You know, some things we just all share. And wait, I got a question. Those goodies there, um, would you eat those when you finished party, party, partying? Of course you would. And will we get to eat them when we're done here today? But of course. <laughs> A number of people have written stories trying to explain why we have a shortest day and the longest night. And I think we have some people online who are going to be sharing their stories with us. Our first story is going to be read by Alyssa from Waltham. Alyssa, please share your story with us. Okay, here she is. My, my solstice story. During the ancient times, I worked as a farmer. I lived in a village with with lots of farms, land, beautiful mountains, and a river running through it. I live in a stone house in a river near the river. 
I eat fish from the river and vegetables from the farm. I wear layers of clothing. I spend my day working on the farm, picking vegetables and feeding the animals. The days are growing shorter and colder. The nights longer and more brutal. My fears are shorter days means less sun for my crops. And cold nights will freeze the crops and they will die. I really don't know why this is happening. But to make things better, I would pray to the gods of the harvest, bring back the sun. I gave hope to my people that better days are ahead. Oh, thank you so much. So your answer was, I mean, you gave us this beautiful vision of what it was like as the days grew shorter. How you eat, I love that you fished from the, um, from the stream nearby and the food that you got from the farm. And that you gave people faith, that there wasn't any really magic that would bring it back, but just their belief. Thank you for that. Now, Tinu from Waltham also has a poem about the solstice. Tinu, are you ready to share that with us? Winter solar system. Where did the sun go? It is colder than ever. Nights are dark. The days are shorter. Everyone is getting ready for winter. Return sun. Some people are mad. Our winter trees go to sleep. Let your children play in the snow. Sun come back. The nights are longer. It is very cold colder than an ice cube. Every child is happy that winter is coming. I love that. Because you know how like adults and children have a completely different take on winter. The adults are looking out and going, oh, it's snowing. And the children are looking out and going, hey, it's snowing. And that's just what your poem felt like, that you had both of those balances. I think we have one more story from Waltham from Amy. Amy, you ready? Sorry. My name is Susan Island. I am a medicine woman. I work in a log cabin and I live in a log cabin in the woods. My home is kind of warm but a little cold. My family and I depend on the fire to keep us warm. We eat stew, fruit, vegetables, and plenty of meat. Our clothes are made from wool and cotton. Every day I harvest the garden. My fears are that some children will freeze or get frostbites. I don't know why it's happening, but I don't like it. I'll just have to wait till the sun comes out. Next year, we will have much more food and warmer blankets. Amy, thank you. And what I heard in that story was that as a child, you have faith that it will get better, and you will just keep preparing and preparing more fully. Thank you. I think we have one more poem from Sean. Sean, are you ready? Wonderful, wonderful snow bunny. In the snow, you can play, play with your slide. Terrible weather. Everybody loves winter, except some people. Run in the snow all day. Skating is starting. On Christmas, you get toys. Love spreads. Some people celebrate Han Hanukkah. Teachers get worried, ice everywhere, cities get piles of snow, everybody wants the sun. Thank you very, very much. And it's nice because, you know, you included in your poem a lot of the variables that we've talked about in terms of solstice. Talked about people becoming afraid, talked about the sharing of gifts. Thank you, you guys. When I'm done with the rest of the story, you're going to see more pictures. But right now, from Cummington, we're going to show you a few pictures while I recap or remind you what happened in the first part of the legend of Unicorn Mountain. When the days are the shortest and the nights are the longest, and cold covers the earth like a great blanket. The unicorn comes to the mouth of its cave, and with its powerful legs, it kicks the winds of winter into the breezes of spring. That's the story 
that Jayma always told to her three best friends, the cow, the goat, and the chicken. And they always listened in awe and with love. She kept the scarf around her neck that her mother had made for her, the scarf that she embroidered the unicorn on at the very edge, the last thing she had made for Jayma before she had died. Oh, she wished she could spend all the time with her three best friends, but there were duties in the house. Her brothers were getting ready for the winter and also for the winter festival where they all met in the town hall where they would sing the songs that would warm the air and do the dances that would wake the earth and the play of St. George. But the wind, the wind that winter was worse than anything anyone had ever remembered. It beat on the side of the house. It played havoc with the wood pile. And all of the people just sat looking into the fire not paying attention to the farm, to the world, not even meeting to sing the songs or do the dances or the play. And on that day that should have been the shortest and the night that should have been the longest, the unicorn didn't come to the mouth of its cave. And Jama knew she would have to climb that mountain and wake the great beast. The Legend of Unicorn Mountain, part two. Chema got up before anyone else had woken. The sun, the day was almost nothing. And she had to find out why the unicorn hadn't come to the mouth of its cave. She put on her warmest clothes, wrapped that scarf around her neck, the one with the unicorn on the edge. And she pushed out of the door of her family's house. But before climbing up the mountain, she had to say goodbye to her three best friends, the cow, the goat, and the chicken. She pushed into the barn door and pushed it shut. And her three best friends, they looked so miserable. I know it's cold, chicken. I'm going to find out why the unicorn hasn't come and kick those winds into spring. Man, man, weather. No, it's bad weather, goat. But don't worry, I'm, I'm sure the unicorn will do its job. Mm, mostly miserable. I know it's miserable, cow. But don't worry, I'll, I'll make it better. I'm going up the mountain. Bad idea, bad idea. Mostly dangerous. Mostly. Don't worry, friends. It won't be that hard for me. I'll just sort of skip to the top and see why the unicorn hasn't woken up. And Jama started to walk to the door of the barn, but her three best friends stood there, and they wouldn't let her out. M -m -m mind over m matter. Mind over matter? Cow, why do you want me to think about that? M -m -m mind over m matter. Okay, I'll remember. Be cautious, not cavalier. Be cautious, not cavalier. Hey, chicken, I'll be as careful as I can be and I won't act too brave. Gosh, is that okay? Manter. Goat, that's what you do. You like to argue about everything, not me. B -b -b banter. Okay, I'll banter, but I don't know with a ba Okay, I'll argue mind over matter, I promise. But I have to go now, I have to. I have to. And the three animals moved aside. And Jama went to push through the barn door. But the wind. Can you help me? <whistles> the wind was pushing against that barn door. And Jama, all eight years full of strength, couldn't get out. She pushed and pushed. Move. move. But the cow put her wide, warm side against that door and <gasps> pushed it open. Jama slipped out. And she began to walk across that farm and up the mountain. The wind, the wind was brutal. It cut at her arms and her legs and her face. But the worst part of climbing that mountain was the wind piercing her ears because it laughed at her. It shied at her. 
it haunted her. <whistles> I chill the night. I kill the leaf. I freeze the air. I stop belief. <whistles> I chill the night. I kill the leaf. I freeze the earth. I st stop it, wind. Stop it. I know what you think you do, but stop it. I chill the night. I kill the leaf. I freeze. Stop it. Stop it. The wind wouldn't have pounded in her ear, repeating itself again and again and again. Peter. Peter. How could I argue with the wind? The wind is so much. I chill the night. Yes, you do. You do chill the night wind. But then the, the, the sun comes up every morning. And every night that you've chilled is warmed again by the beautiful sun. I chill the leaf. I chill the leaf. Yes. Yes, you do. Of course you kill the leaf. And the tree thanks you for it. Because if you didn't take the leaves off every fall and throw them on the ground, the tree couldn't sleep through the winter and get its strength back so that it would be ready to bloom in the spring. I freeze the earth. I freeze the earth. I freeze. Yes. Yes, you do. You freeze the earth a half an inch or a whole inch or in some places maybe even two inches. And the earth thanks you. Help me out. But do you know what, wind? Beneath that. Beneath it, that's where the worms live. And the ants and the mice and all of the creatures, they stay warm under that crust you've made. They thank you. And the wind, help me here, was so enraged that it beat and cracked and flung itself at the earth. But its crust was so efficient. It could not break through it. I stop belief. I stop belief. I stop belief. Yes, yes, you did. You stopped the belief of my father and my brothers. You stopped the belief of all the people in the town. <laughs> The wind laughed hideously. Its laughter filled the earth, laughed like the wind. I stop, belief. They don't do the dances. They're not singing the songs. They didn't. I stop, belief. I stop, belief. But wind, you didn't stop me. I believe. I know that the spring is coming as soon as the unicorn wakes up. As soon as I get to the mouth of that cave and wake her, You'll be the warm breezes of spring. And as powerful as it remained, the wind lost its voice. Chema continued to climb, the wind beating in her face, her hands, in her ears. And she came to a place in the mountain where there was a crevasse. She would have to walk down. It would take her another hour. It was so cold. And when she turned again, she saw a bridge. It was a rope bridge. Oh, it'll save me so much time. And she ran towards it. But then she heard her friend, the chicken. Be back, cautious, not cavalier. You're right, chicken. What if the bridge isn't strong enough? And she took a huge stone, as large as she could find. She knew it would weigh almost as much as she did. And she pushed it right to the top of that rope bridge. <laughs> and no sooner had it rolled onto the bridge than the bridge disappeared. In a thousand gusts of wind, little pieces of rope and hemp and leaves. It had been a bridge woven with nothing but wind. Thank you, chicken. I could have died. And Jama began the climb, down the steep 
crevasse, and then up again. The wind was brutal. She couldn't feel her fingers anymore. Her nose, her cheeks. She knew her feet were underneath her because she was still moving. But she couldn't feel them any longer either. And she continued to climb. And she could see the top of the mountain, but now it wasn't even cold. It was exhaustion that stopped her. If I could just stop, give me some wind. If I could just stop for a little while, if I could just rest. And then she saw it. Not a full cave, but a place underneath a great shutting rock. I could just stop in there. I could just rest for a minute. Now, do you know what will happen if she falls asleep? What would happen to you if you fell asleep in the brutal freezing cold? And the wind. See if you can do this with me. It went from brutal to gentle. A soft laugh as it pushed her towards that place underneath the ledge. Help me out. Oh, wind. I, I know you wouldn't be under here and I could just rest. Just for a minute. I'm so tired. And Jama put herself underneath that ledge. And the wind, it felt like it was rocking. Almost like a cradle. And Jama's eyes closed. She wanted nothing more than to sleep. But in her mind, even though the wind was cradling, she heard the words of the cow. M -m -m mind over m -m -m matter. What does that mean? Mind over matter? It means mind thinking. It means in thinking something can be more important than matter, than what you feel and what you see. If I stay here, I'll die. My mind, I have to think war. I have to think spring. I can't see snow. I have to see grass, beautiful green grass. And I can't see chips of ice. I have to see daffodils. And I don't feel you, wind. I feel the breezes of spring. And as Jama built through her mind, spring all around her, the wind, strike as it tried, could not penetrate her world. So beautiful and warm. Until she climbed all the way to the mouth of the cave at the top of the mountain. But no sooner was she ready to step into it than the wind set itself around it like a tornado, whirling around and around and around. Jama came close to it and it grabbed her scarf and it would have choked her if she hadn't practiced being the tail of St. George's dragon. And she spun around, but the wind, it got her scarf and went around and around and around. I can't go through. The wind will take me with it, with the scarf. I'm never going to get in. Would Mama have done? In the coldest days of winter, Mama used to hold me. And she'd say, you are my soft breath of spring. The warm, the wind would hate the soft breath of spring. And so Jama took a breath. And you know how when it's bitter, icy, and freezing, that breath falls down into your lungs and it stings them. She warmed it inside her. And then, <sighs> the wind recoiled at her warmth. And she stepped quickly into the cave of the unicorn. There was the beast, white and pure and muscled, with the beautiful horn shining at one end. Jama was afraid. Well, she ran over, and the first thing she did was she put her hand right under its nose to feel for breath. It was still alive. OK, wake up, unicorn. Unicorn, wake up now. Unicorn, wake up.
but it wouldn't move. And she didn't know why, but she started to sing the song that they sang in the middle of the winter, the one that was supposed to warm the sky. I will sing in the praise of you And the ears of the unicorn <laughs> started to tremble. For if we don't labor, how can there be bread? And they were shaking. I will sing and make merry with all. And the dances, she started. Bum, 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 ba da dum, bum, bum, ba da dum, bum, ba da 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 dum, bum, bum. For Jama had watched the men every year, and she knew those dances like they were her own. E um, bum, bum, ba da dum, bum, bum, ba da dum, bum, ba da 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 dum, bum, bum. And the unicorn's body began to tremble, and she looked for a stick, and she ran, and she grabbed it. This is the sword of St. George. As you die like the winter, so too will you rise with new hope in the spring. And she touched it to the unicorn's shoulder. Unicorn! And that great beast bowed towards Jema. Will you? It backed up went to the mouth of the cave, and with its powerful hind leg, it kicked the winds, and a howling scream was heard. And it kicked, and it kicked a third time. And you could hear the wind dying and retreating and falling away. You did it. I knew you could. Mama told me so. And Jama ran out of the cave, and she found her scarf, the one with the unicorn. No. I give it to you. We'll never forget you. And Jama stepped from that cave. And as she started down the mountain, it was as if spring came in her wake, the grass growing the flowers blooming, and her father and brothers who had been looking for her, Jema, Jema girl, here! And I can tell you that next year, when the days were the shortest and the nights were the longest and cold covered the earth like a great blanket, it was Jema in the tail of that great beast. And it was Jema who made sure that they always sang the songs that warmed the air and the dances that woke the earth. And they never forgot their rituals to make sure that spring would come. I want to share some of the beautiful pictures that you sent in to us. You'll see renditions of the unicorn, of the solstice, of Jama climbing her mountain, of St. George and the dragon. I can't thank you enough. And I hope that you notice these days for we're coming very, very soon to that special one where the day is the shortest and the night is the longest. And you will make your celebration of the winter solstice.